I want to talk to you tonight not about what's happening in your backyard or in my backyard, but on the planet as a whole. Um, we no longer live on the planet any of us were born on. Right? We are in the throes of nonlinear and sometimes even really exponential changes. Right? We have a growing population. Uh, we're headed towards a peak population of around 10 billion towards the second half of the century, around 2070. And it's worth remembering also that the, the population challenge that we face is no longer that we're having too many babies, right? We're, we're actually at peak baby. We're not having any more babies each year. We've, we've leveled off. Our population is growing now because we're not dying. And it's kind of hard to argue with that, right? <laughs> I, I don't really know who's going to bring forward the pro-dying platform, but I'm probably not going to get behind that one. Um, you know, we're urbanizing at a frantic rate. Uh, most of that has to do with opportunity. Uh, when people move to cities, in aggregate, their lives get better. Um, they get access to legal rights, to jobs, to education, to health care. Um, women, in particular, their lives improve dramatically over being poor in the countryside. And so billions of people this century are, have, and the last have moved to cities or are in the process of moving there. Somewhere upwards of 250,000 people every day. Right? So that's like building Boulder in the morning, taking a break, building Boulder in the afternoon, then working a little overtime to build another Boulder, half one, half of one, every day. Right? And we know that that reality of many more people uh, with lots more urbanization, lots more development on a finite planet is a difficult one. And we find ourselves having to re-examine what we thought was real and what we thought was realistic and instead come up with a new reality-based realism. <laughs> and that's going to be tough for us. Because, see, the 20th century had a dream. It was a fun dream. But it ran on oil and on non-renewable resources. And it depended on putting a car or two or three in every garage and sprawling out as far as the eye could see, and subsidizing that sprawl with trillions of dollars. And we now have the situation where about a quarter to a third of every American metro is this outer ring exurban sprawl. Another quarter to a third, depending on, again, the city, is the inner ring, right? Older suburbs often built in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, um, which worked on a different model. And then you have the core city. Here's the problem. Our core cities aren't even dense enough to be sustainable. And we are finding out really fast that the dream of you know, an American automotive utopia has crashed and burned. Um, those dreams have encountered reality. We still believe that we live in a stable version of a society that no longer exists. Right? The society that built the suburbs and believed they could maintain them, that exploited natural resources and believed we could continue, right? that society just doesn't exist anymore. We already live on a different planet. And the bill is coming due. Right? All around the country, all around the world, we have high energy, high resource infrastructure, and high energy and high resource places which are coming undone, right? You might have heard that the new rust belt is the asphalt belt. And we're seeing a demographic inversion of rich people moving to core cities and poor people being pushed way out on the periphery. And this has real consequences, as we, as we just heard, right? Um, if you were going to design the very worst place to be poor, it would be to be carless in an American exurb. Um, this is not my picture, but one time I was being shown around a, an exurb. 
uh, by a fella who has been doing some work there. And he's pointing out the shopping carts. Do any of you know why you see shopping carts next to bus stands? It's because people who don't have cars need a way to get their stuff to the bus. And if you live half a mile, mile, whatever, from the bus stop, that's the only way you're going to get it there. And this has real problems. There are two kinds of cities that go bankrupt in America, or, and are going bankrupt in America right now. Rust Belt cities with steep population declines, and American exurbs that are auto-dependent and have low productivity land uses. And you know we're seeing it all over. California is rife with cities that are uh, going bankrupt or narrowly avoiding it. And here's the thing. All of this is built on a system that was never designed to last very long. Um, so our roads, we, don't, you know, we ignore them. I ignored them, at least. And every once in a while, I see something that I, I, I kind of get a little obsessed by it, and I start geeking out, and then the next thing you know, I work for myself, I have an understanding boss, like, <laughs> you know, and I'm off and running. And I got obsessed with asphalt, because I, I go to a lot of cities, I talk to a lot of people in a lot of cities, I walk around cities all the time, and I realized I see asphalt literally every day, and I'd never thought at all about what it is, right? I talk about housing and transportation, the environment, et cetera, and I never really thought about what the roads are. And so I started looking into it, and it is an amazing like, world of its own with all sorts of really cool like, jargon, like alligator cracking and other things like that. But, but the real takeaway is this. Here's what I didn't know. Roads have lifespans. An average road, you build it, if you maintain it pretty well, and about 10 years on, you give it a facelift, uh, it will go for 20 years. At 20 years, you may need to get in there and you know, fix some of the deeper potholes or other problems that have happened. But then, again, if you maintain it another 10 years, it will last 40. Almost every road, when it gets to 40, starts being at risk of needing to be substantially reworked. Right? And this is, this is normal. This is part of the design. And when you need to do that, you need to get in there, rebuild the roadbed. You know, you're talking giant machinery that's pleasing to small boys. Um, you know, like lots of Tonka truck stuff, right? It's a big deal. And here's the two things about it. First of all, it's high carbon. It's incredibly high carbon to replace roads. Second of all, it's expensive. It's about a million dollars per lane mile once you need to get in and mess with it at that level. How many lane miles of road does Boulder have? How many of them are in perfect condition or well-maintained? If you're like almost every city, including wealthy cities in the country, there's a portion of your roads, could be a quarter, could be a third, which are reaching the end of their lifespan and have been poorly maintained to boot. So the best estimate I could find of the cost to repairing, for repairing America's roads over the next roughly 15 years, if we decided to replace our aging road infrastructure, was $1.8 trillion. I don't do a lot of projections. I don't do a lot of predictions. I'm not that kind of futurist. But I will tell you, we're not going to spend $1.8 trillion on roads over the next 15 years. And there are other problems with that model, right? Because we're not alone. We live on a planet with lots of people rising out of poverty, and they can't replicate the models we've built. Right? They don't want to, because it hasn't worked out well so far. So here's northern China on a clear winter's day a few years back. Here's northern China the next day. That's not rain or snow right, or fog. That's air pollution. There was a weather effect that, that kept all the air pollution close to the ground. And that day, the air quality index in Beijing reached 775. Now, to give you uh, uh, an indication, uh, the World Health Organization says 300 is the upper safe limit for humans. And that day, San Francisco, which doesn't have the cleanest air, had an air quality index of 42. So 775 is really bad. Um, it's like, don't go outside, don't run around, don't breathe if you can avoid it, kind of bad, right? 
And because there were a lot of problems, the, the government very helpfully decided to release some mascots to help people understand what air quality indexes were and how to understand, how to see them. So you see excellent smiles, slight pollution, a little worried, moderate pollution crying, serious pollution, her eyes are melting, you know. Um, but, you know, this being a Beijing project, a bunch of Shanghai bloggers decided to add their own, which is Beijing pollution. Um, <laughs> You know, so we're not going to build America all over the world. That isn't going to happen. Also, this is a great example of how there are problems we're used to thinking about that are linear, because the solution to people dropping dead in the street from air pollution is clean up your air quality, right? And you clean up the air quality, and people stop dropping dead, right? Pretty, pretty direct connection. But our planetary crisis is full of problems that aren't like this. Our planetary crisis is full of problems that once you set in motion, set them in motion, they become other problems, right? They set in motion further problems. They're irreversible, right? And let's see if perhaps I can get this to go. OK, well, that was the coolest effect in my whole slideshow. But um, <laughs> you, can, you can go look at it yourself here. It's, uh, it may start, uh, my machine is temperamental. I'll tell you what it does. It basically says, hey, here's what temperature's like. And it shows every year temperature getting wider and uh, going outwards in the temperature spiral, right? Um, you can look it up for yourself. The, the guy's Twitter handle's right there. Um, the point being that we live on a planet. Oh, here, okay. Let's watch in reverence. <laughs> this is actual recorded temperatures. And you'll notice that 2016 is doing something really weird, right? The, la the top five hottest months on record are the last five months. Scientists at Germany's Potsdam Institute, so these are German scientists, right? <laughs> Not known for being like real hand wavy. <laughs> um, they announced that they believe we are now in a climate emergency, right? That we have actually, that the observed behavior of the planet has left the model that we were used to. Um, we're seeing this up in the Arctic, where we're seeing un unprecedented melt. Um, some scientists up there who are measuring Greenland uh, in April, you may have heard, they, they uh, announced that it's, uh, it was basically a, a, almost like a factor of 10 worsening of the situation, right? This massive leap. They had, to, they, they had this quote where they're like, we had to check our models and make sure they were right, because it was totally unprecedented. Right? We're seeing this in other ways, too, storms, right? We're seeing the incidence of thousand-year storms <laughs> increasing to the point where they're becoming like blasé to news organizations, right? They're like, I don't know, we could put that thousand-year storm in the Philippines on. Or, you know, Trump's actually going to say something. <laughs> and here's the thing. Not only are the direct impacts now getting worse really fast, really fast, but the longer we wait, the greater the danger of truly catastrophic impacts, right? So this is something that I think is underplayed in the media coverage. So people talk about two degrees, right? Two degrees as an upper safe limit for warming. And we can debate whether that, in fact, is safe. You'll note that at the Paris climate talks in, in November of last year, December of last year, the, the resolution was to try and go back down to 1.5 in the, in the target, because things are really crazy now. But at, at, at 450 ppm, which is roughly the, the two degree goal, we have a three tenths of 1% chance of seeing runaway climate change of greater than six degrees being the outcome. Three tenths of 1%. So that's not real great. I prefer that be, being zero tenths of 1% myself. But you know, it's still a small number. But when you get up to the higher concentrations, right, 
the atmosphere starts, it's, it's like, you know, big chunks of carbon are like giving the atmosphere shots, right? A few shots, it's gonna start lecturing you about why you're wrong about something, assuming it's a male atmosphere. Um, <laughs> the, uh, you know, but you give it enough shots and it starts getting a little wobbly. And there is that shot, you know there is that shot where everything just goes all to hell and they're like flopping around like a vaudeville Irish drunk. You know, I can say that, I'm part Irish. Um, and uh, so at 700 ppm, parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is roughly 3.5, right? We'd be at roughly 3.5 if things kind of work the way they're supposed to. We have an 11% chance of runaway climate change. Better than one in 10, right? And I can tell you, two degrees is not good. It's not good. Four degrees is so bad that one of my favorite climate scientists, and I'm geeky enough to have favorite climate scientists, um, <laughs> Kevin Anderson says, we should avoid four degrees literally at all costs because the costs of the impacts will outweigh the value of civilization. That's four degrees. We're talking six or more degrees. All right, the last time it was six degrees hotter, there were alligators in the Arctic, right? 11%. Right, so we're not just talking about the impacts that are likely to happen, we're talking about impacts that could happen that are really dire. And we know already that we've set a bunch of things in motion that haven't happened yet, but are now inevitable, including sea level rise, right? And some of these things are easier to see. You know, here I, I understand people are talking a lot about water and the health of the forests and so forth in the mountains. You know, coastal cities, we're pretty concerned about the fact that the sea is about to rise up and swallow us. Um, but you know, wherever you go, there's, a, there's an impact that people are worried about. But the thing is, I don't know of a single major system that we depend on that isn't under threat with climate change, directly or indirectly. This is San Francisco. That's the waterfront of San Francisco with, uh, I think that's three meters. Um, which is why we're getting all these scientific bodies, medical uh, associations, national militaries, the reinsurance industry, and they're all basically standing there with their hair on fire going, ah! That's the scientific term, of course. Um, in part, because these problems that we've already set in motion, already, and we are setting more in motion every day, demand really expensive fixes. Protecting a, sea, a city from sea level rise is really expensive, right? There's a term for that kind of protection we need to do, which is ruggedization. It comes from the military. A ruggedized laptop is a laptop that can take a shock and continue to offer the performance needed, right? So you can shoot my laptop and I'll still be able to check Facebook, right? <laughs> and we need systems that are ruggedized against much wider ranges of temperature, against sudden weather events, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But here's the real kicker. Ruggedization costs and places have values. We don't like to talk about it, but they do, right? Anything in our lives has a value. Um, and we come to this really awkward term that the insurance industry started using a lot, which is residual damage. It sounds pretty plain, right? It's kind of like, well, you know, you have some residual damage. <laughs> but here's what residual damage is. Residual damage is the polite term for climate adaptations we can't afford to make, right? I'll show you a little chart, right? So you have the value, right, of the thing. Uh, if you avoid damage to this system, it will make you this amount of money over time. And you have how much it costs to avoid that damage. At a certain point, right, things cost more to protect than they're worth. And here's the problem with continuing to spew CO2 and other climate gases into the atmosphere, is that the costs go up on a steady basis, right? Or worse yet, not on a steady basis. And so more and more things become more and more expensive to protect. When Kevin Anderson talks about four degrees being something we need to avoid at all costs, what he's saying is four degrees pushes so many things into residual damage that it's like you know, the value of everything. Um, now this can be kind of abstract, and so I wanna give you a concrete example. This is a, uh, I think it's Fish and Wildlife Service map that shows the, uh, the, the future habitat of Burmese pythons at four degrees Celsius. We know they're already in uh, Florida. 
So if it were four degrees warmer, this is everywhere where Burmese py pythons could maybe live or definitely live. And I noticed that my home includes this. And you know, there aren't a lot of things that I'm willing to say not in my backyard, <laughs> but a giant frickin' Burmese python is one of them. And the more temperatures rise, the more pythons we're gonna be fighting, folks. You know? And at what point do you just say, fine, hell with it, you take the house, python, I'm leaving. Right? That's residual damage. And that's what we should be worrying about. Because I'll tell you something. So we have seen the first few federally assisted abandonments, right? A couple islands in Louisiana, uh, which are no longer habitable, where the feds are relocating people to new places. Those are the first official abandonments of US land to climate change. But we're seeing unofficial abandonment all over the place. Because here's what unofficial abandonment looks like. It's like, yeah, we know that thing's gonna fall down, but you know, probably won't fall down in my term of office. And then it falls down, and then we don't fix it, right? Well, this is not just a problem for those of us who end up on the other side of that bridge needing to get to work or wrestling with a python or whatever. It's actually a threat to the global economy. Um, so this is Mark Carney. He's the governor of the Bank of England, and he calls inaction on climate change a threat as large to the economy as the 2007 subprime crisis. And specifically, because it's a double whammy of there's all the dangers climate change brings, but there's also the fact that we're still pouring money into oil, coal, and gas. Oil, coal, and gas that we cannot burn, right? The carbon bubble is like the housing bubble, potentially. That's what he thinks, at least. Now, why don't we know all this? Why don't we talk about this every day? Why is this not, in, you know, when you have like national militaries saying our, our major threat, including our own, our major threat is climate change and other parts of the planetary crisis, why aren't we thinking about this every single morning? Well, there's a reason. Because people have paid a ton of money to keep us from thinking about this, right? We've dealt with a denial industry that's now four decades old and incredibly fucking successful, pardon my French, right? <laughs> Um, it's coming out more and more how much money has actually been spent directly and indirectly to influence our minds, right? And so we have, for instance, the largest peer-reviewed scientific process in the history of humanity is climate science, right? And are the findings of the climate scientists together. And yet we still have roughly a third of America who thinks climate is a hoax. Um, we could call that a tragedy, or we could call it an amazing return on the investment of 10 or 20 billion dollars in lies and PR, right? And because we don't talk about it, we don't talk about the most important part about it, which is that we have a carbon budget. The amount of warming that we get on the planet, to return to basics, is determined by the atmospheric concentration of the gases that heat our planet. If we want to keep things to two degrees, minimize the number of pythons we need to wrestle, we need to limit our warming to about 1,000 gigatons of carbon. We're already you know, cruising along using a big chunk of that. And at current rates, we're going to run out of it. The, the faster we keep burning it, obviously, the quicker the budget runs out. Right? It's just like that weekend we're not talking about in Vegas, right? where you're like, you know, ah, oh, one more bet. Um, but here's the big thing. If we do nothing, we wind up with a really steep drop that we need to do if we're going to avoid catastrophe. That is not the best way to do it. But what all of these futures and what every future, I would argue, that we face has in common is that we're going to end up at zero emissions or even potentially below, which we can talk about, right? Even if we delay action, we're still going to end up at zero because remember residual damage, right? It's just that what we're going to do in the meantime is expose ourselves to a ton more risk, right? And end up having to spend a lot more money, right? So there's no trade-off at all here between the economy and climate action. There's only a trade-off between individual investments in high carbon systems and climate action. And the longer we wait, 
the steeper the curve needs to get. And I think this is actually one of the things, when we're going back to that, you know, there are problems we're used to dealing with, like air quality, and problems we're not used to dealing with, like climate, because we're not used to thinking about problems that get dramatically worse in a short period of time. And one of the big things about climate change and all of the related issues in the planetary crisis is that they were different problems a few decades ago, right? It's not just that we thought differently about them. They were actually different problems, right? If, you know, Carter had won a second term and had kept the solar panels on the White House and made us all wear sweaters and et cetera, and we'd like, you know, charged into a low energy future, we might not have this kind of a curve now, right? And doing things like solar panels and smaller cars and sweaters might have been enough to stave off climate apocalypse. But we didn't do that, right? In fact, we did the exact opposite, right? Um, uh, we went for burn, baby, burn. And so we are now in this situation where the drops are so steep that we now have people advocating for net negative emissions, right? Um, uh, what some people call drawdown. And there's only one real problem with it. This is actually the, basically the, the, the official plan for the planet at the moment. Um, there's only one real problem with this is that, like, we don't know how to do that. <laughs> um, there, we have some great trial programs and a couple, like, scientific, you know, pilots and so forth that indicate we may be able to do it, maybe. But that's, you know, that's betting a lot on we may be able to do it, maybe. And so, we, the most important thing to know from this slide is that there is no rewind. One of the messages, we were in climate denial, right? Now we're not in climate denial anymore. Most, most credible people in most countries are saying, yes, we have a climate problem, right? But the climate problem is so severe that we're going to have to reverse climate change. And you're gonna hear this more and more. We're going to reverse climate change. Yes, we're going to do what we can now, and then we're going to reverse climate change. And here's the problem with reversing climate change is that it's total bull hokey, right? The latest science shows that there is no rewind, that once you introduce the heat into the system, the heat's in the system. Once you've introduced the carbon into the, you know, into the oceans and the soil that has sunk there as we've been emitting it, if you reduce the carbon that's in the atmosphere, more comes out, right? So we may be able to like turn the heat down a little in the future, but we definitely can't rewind things back. And when I say we, I really mean we. And here's the other tricky part of it, is that it's people like us and our relatives and our neighbors and our compatriots who are responsible for the largest per capita shares of greenhouse gases. And it gets even worse when you start doing this, which is consumption. So this gets really geeky and awkward and somebody really needs to make a great YouTube video about all this. But like, we can measure our, the energy we burn directly in our lives, right, by driving, heating our homes, whatever, or we can measure all the energy that gets used on our behalf, whether it's inside our home or inside our city or not. And when you do that, it turns out Americans have a way higher footprint than we thought. And that in fact, our economy is much higher intensity with carbon than we thought. You know, and the big problem with this is that it means that the money we're making now, the economy that we have now, essentially looks like this, <laughs> right? We have, as Paul Hawkins says, an economy which steals the future, sells it in the present, then calls it GDP, <laughs> right? And with all of these problems, there's a common thread. The longer you wait, the worse it is. And I would argue that that thread is actually common not just to climate change, but to housing problems and all sorts of other problems, right? That the consequences accrue the longer you wait, or put in a very blunt way, inaction is injustice. And doing nothing is not neutral, right? Doing nothing is not neutral. Doing nothing means that we are continuing extremely horrible consequences, right? That maybe even intensifying them. What do we do about that? Right? Well, there's one answer, you know. Um, <laughs> you know. But imagining the dark is easy, right? It's, it's pretty easy to imagine the dystopia. It's pretty easy to imagine the world in which, you know, our manatee overlords condemn us to, you know, a prehistoric existence. But 
that just might be me. Um, you know, it's harder though to imagine, to imagine actually solving the problems we face. In fact, it's really hard. Um, I have spent my life writing about planetary issues, sustainability, and human progress, right? One of my very first jobs was covering the very first UN Earth Summit as a reporter. Yeah, I'm really old. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, so I've been doing this pretty much since we've been talking about it as a species. And I've written books about, you know, how do we start to change the systems around us to uh, actually enable us to dramatically reduce our carbon emissions while better meeting human needs and, and leading to better, more interesting society. And I've given talks about this, a lot of talks, way too many talks. Um, I probably single-handedly melted a small glacier somewhere. Um, and the problem is it's really hard to talk in really true ways about complex systems that change in ways that are beyond our current experience and understanding. It's really hard. Now, I can, I can run through you, with you one thread of things, which is energy, right? So we all know that climate is not the only part of the planetary crisis we face, but it is a really important one. Um, and we all know that energy is not the only thing that causes climate change, but it is the major thing. So we can look at energy and its impacts on climate and how we use energy and how we generate it, and we can discover some things about the nature of the kind of changes that we're up against. So the first thing that we need to think about is we need to sort of adjust our mindset a little bit. We're used to hearing that the solution to climate change is clean energy. Who here has heard that idea? Right. Um, There's a problem with that. The way we're using energy now and the growth of global energy use is such that we need to basically, we will on current rates, double our energy use by 2050 as a species. That means we need to replace every bit of energy we're using anywhere on the planet with clean energy and then do it again in the next 34 years. That may not be a realistic goal. You know, we want every bit of energy we can get, but it's not the only thing we can do. In fact, if you talk to people who are really, you know, digging into these numbers, what you'll hear is this. In fact, it is now uh, an official global stance that the most important thing is energy reduction, right? Because here's the thing, we suck at using energy. We're terrible at it. We waste it all over the place. I'm gonna give you one example, our buildings. There's a kind of building called a passive house building. Who here has heard of Passive House? Oh, you're so geeky. <laughs> um, so Passive House uh, is a kind of building, it's a green building approach where you super insulate the envelope, make it really, really well insulated, and you use several other uh, tools and approaches to reduce the, the energy use of the building, especially the thermal energy use for heating and cooling. And if you do it right and you site it right, it can reduce that heating and cooling load 80 to 90%, depending on the climate you're in, when you're building the building. That's a really big deal, right? 80 to 90% less energy is kind of something, right? Why are we still building any buildings that aren't this? Why? Like, we can do this. It doesn't cost any more money over time. I mean, I know the short-term reasons, but we should be doing this everywhere, right? And the reason why is because if you can reduce energy use at the source, you can reduce a lot more energy use overall. Um, so this is my best design slide, and um, here's what it tells you. If you're using 10 units of energy to make your air conditioner go, right, if it's, if it's using 10 units of electricity, well, first of all, any appliance is only so efficient. So if you want those 10 units of electricity to turn into cooling, you actually have to spend like 50 units of energy, and it works no matter what units of energy you want to use, to get that to work. Right? But you also have to get the energy to the appliance in the first place. And there's some losses on the, on the transmission lines. And then you have the power plant. 
itself. And the power plant, if it's any fossil fuel, any kind of fossil fuel power plant, wastes a lot of energy right up the smokestack, right? It burns a ton of coal, and half of that energy goes, you know, through the wires. And then you have to actually dig up or pump or whatever the energy to get it there in our current system. So when you get rid of an air conditioner, you're not getting rid of 10 units of electricity, right? You're getting rid of 133. Right? Demand reduction has these cascading benefits, right? So you get like extra goodies every time you save energy. And here's the secret, is that we know of one absolutely phenomenal way of reducing energy demand, and it's something you're all already trying to do, which is build better cities. It is the single best proven finding in urban planning that as you bring people closer together, the amount of energy they use on transportation goes down, right? And if the amount of energy they're using on transportation, transportation goes down, so do their emissions. So you can compare a place like Atlanta and Barcelona. They're similar sized cities. You'll see the difference in their footprint, but you'll also see that people in Barcelona use one-tenth of the amount of energy to get around, right? And the reasons are really simple, right? That when you live close by to things, uh, you are able to get to them, obviously, without necessarily having to get in a car, right? And the most sustainable trip you're ever gonna make is not the trip in the Tesla, it's the trip that you didn't need the Tesla to take, right? Um, access by proximity, to use the geeky term, is one of our absolutely best climate strategies. And it has other benefits, of course, right? So I'm a huge fan of Sightline, so it's like, you know, I got to, got to be a fanboy here and listen to some awesome Sightline kind of information. Uh, Alan Durning over at Sightline has this great story that he told um, about how he was asked, uh, you know, if it made any sense for him being a you know, busy person to bike and walk to work. And so he did the numbers and he figured out how much time does it take to bike or walk to work. And what he came up with was that Actually, it doesn't take any time at all because the longevity increase you get from active transportation is greater than the time you spend, right? So as he put it, time spent walking is utterly free because it's time you're going to spend dead, right? <laughs> or you would have spent dead. Um, and we know that it's possible to design places to be much more walkable by targeting where we put the density. right? There's other things, of course. You need a good street. You know, There's lots and lots of good pieces of this. Uh, please, you know, assume that we're also going to talk about all of those. But for right now, what we're talking about is walk shed planning, which is how we ought to be thinking about things. Given any particular person in the city, what's within their walk shed? What are they willing to walk to? And the goal of a good city should be to put as much as possible within their walk shed, right? And this is actually really good news, because I'll tell you one of the best things about density is it, it works on averages. If you want a place to be dense enough to walk, you don't have to make, you don't have to bulldoze every single family residence and replace it with a three-story building, right? You can concentrate growth. You can leave this alone and concentrate growth because the averages will work. That's the basis of the unfortunately uh, now defunct uh, Melbourne city plan, which is the best bit of city planning I know of, where they're going to concentrate all of their new growth on these corridors that would be super high density, right? Um, and transit served, but which would leave everything in green completely alone. So all the parkland, most of the single family residences, most of the industrial land, et cetera. And what it would mean on those streets would be pretty dramatic, right? You'd take a street like this and you'd make it a street like that. So that's a big deal. But what you don't see is on the other side of this block, there are single family homes again, right? So you get a few blocks away, you wouldn't even know this is here. That's one way you can do density that can work for a lot of people. Now, another great thing about density is if you add a ton of it, you get to change the systems, right? And this is like the big opportunity that we're missing in America because it's really hard in our cities to get big chunks of land to put a lot of people there so you can build new systems to serve them. But in the Netherlands, it's so trivial to think this way that students actually design these kinds of things. So you get this kind of, it's, it's, in, it's in the 
original Dutch, if anyone wants to translate for us. Um, but you know, there are various bits of urban systems. They show them adding up, including water and green roofs and energy and so forth. And then they built this nice little rendering of what the whole thing could look like together. Right? This is not hard to do, technically. It's hard to do because in America, we build building by building. And we build slowly <laughs> and slowly <laughs> and really slowly. But we don't have to. Right? And there are better ways to build. There are better materials coming online, ways that we can build that actually store carbon while increasing efficiency. And even more, there are better building techniques. Right? So I'm sure everyone here is familiar with prefab. Um, I think that manufactured building components are the wave of the future. You, know, you have these kind of situations where in, in Vienna, they built this whole dorm. And I think it was four months counting planning time. Uh, and they assembled it, and it looks like this in the lobby. It's all passive house. Right? But even more important, like even weirder and more awesome in a way, is broad sustainable building. Who here has heard of broad sustainable building? OK, so I, I keep trying to find out that this is a hoax, because it feels like it has to be. <laughs> but I know people who've actually met these folks. And they're like, no, 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 it works. It works. So they basically decided, what if we completely redid how you do large scale construction? What if we redesigned it from the ground up? And they built this building system that workers have to be specially trained to use, but where basically the components all fit together in a really logical pattern that supports itself as it goes up and can be done really fast. So this here, they're building J57, which was a 57, is a 57 mixed, sto mix, 57 story mixed use project, easy for me to say, that they built in 20 days, right? Somewhere in China. <laughs> um, we can change cities fast. And there are even new models for how to do it, about how to live in cities, right? So I'm a huge fan of Baugruppen. I, I can't go into it right now. It means building group in German. It comes from Berlin. It's, you know, it's cool. Um, <laughs> it's basically a bunch of people get together and they decide they're going to cut out the middleman of the developer. And they're going to hire the contractors themselves. They're going to raise the money directly in various ways. And in Germany, there's lots of ways for them to do this. And they're going to build a building together at much lower cost. And they're super cool. If you want to check this stuff out, there's a book called Self-Made City that, I don't know, retails for like $9,000. Um, that's one of those beautiful architectural books. It's full of these plans in Berlin. You know, but the point is, we can do things in a new way. And people want to do things in a new way, right? We know that what people want from their buildings is changing fast. Household sizes are growing smaller. People are much more willing to take on uh, smaller units with shared spaces as long as they're within walkable areas, right? Um, as, as one guy put it, you know, the new goal is not a dream house, but a dream neighborhood. And here's one of the things about that, is smaller spaces have an add-on climate benefit which is it's been shown that people who live in denser communities use less stuff. And this, this trend has been growing fast. And there are reasons for this. If you live in a 36 square meter apartment, like this one in Brazil, right, you don't have a lot of extra room to just buy stuff and store it. Right? In fact, these places command premium prices in part because people want to live without having a lot of extra room to clutter up. Right? Um, now, if you don't have a lot of room to buy stuff and store it, you start using things differently. Right? If you live five miles out in a big house and you want to work out more, you might buy a home gym. Right? It might make more sense than believing you're going to drive five miles to go to the gym. You're not going to put a home gym here. Right? You're going to walk down the street and go to the gym. And that kind of uh, ability to take products and services and distribute them among multiple users while still using fewer of them is like the breakthrough thing about cities when you add technology to it, right? Because you know, we, we tend to have things that we don't use a lot. Who here owns a home power drill? OK, the average home power drill gets used somewhere between 6 and 20 minutes in its entire lifetime, <laughs> right? And while they obviously do be, you know, bring a joy of their own, um, like the fact is most of us don't need home power drills. And there are lots of ways that we can get home power drills without having them at home. Right? There are tool sharing services, tool libraries. There are all sorts of startups that will like, you know, 
uh, have somebody bring a tool to you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? There's all sorts of models for sharing tools. And tools are not the only thing you can share. If you happen to live in a very dense neighborhood in Tokyo, in a flat where your landlord will not allow you to have pets, you can go to the cat cafe where you can share a cat while you have your, while you have your tea. Um, and we are only at the very beginning of this because one of, one of the properties of having a lot of things that are getting connected together is that they become capable of more things, right? This is called network effect. But we're also seeing this starting to apply to people and to systems. And I think that the biggest wave of innovation we're about to see is people working together on new models that aren't just the standard like startup with VC money, that aren't just the standard nonprofit that's going broke, you know, et cetera, and people starting to do new things together. We're already starting to see some of this model lapsing back over into the real world, of course, with big companies that are thinking about you know, services in a new way. I assume everybody here is familiar with Uber, right? rise on demand. Um, what people often forget about Uber is that the best thing about Uber is not that if you have a car, you have another way to get a car or get a ride. It's that it lets you not have a car, right? So I got rid of my car a long time ago. Um, and I did it because I did the math. I looked at my payments, my insurance, everything like that. And I almost never drove anyway. And I realized I could literally take a cab everywhere I wanted to go in a month and save money, right? And if it was true for cabs, it's like super true for Uber and Lyft and all those things. And it's about to get even more true because we're about to see self-driving cars, autonomous vehicles, robo-cars, whatever you want to call them. This is another thing where I was super skeptical. I was super skeptical. When people asked me about this like five years ago, I said, oh yeah, maybe 2030, 2040 if we're lucky, you know? Um, but no, I've actually ridden in them. They work, they work now. The problems now are legal barriers, uh, you know, things like insurance problems, code, et cetera. But here's the other thing, is one of the largest companies, one of the largest institutions in the world wants to make them happen. So that kind of tends to make things go a little faster, right? And here's the thing about them. They're gonna be expensive. And they're not gonna be things, I mean, already you can buy a car that will like, you know, be magical autopilot for you, right? That happens now, it'll park itself, it'll take itself down the freeway, it'll stop for things. You know, that will happen, it will keep happening. Our cars will be more and more and more like that, which is good, um, especially for those of us who don't wanna be hit by them. But this is a model where you actually are able to do something like Uber without having drivers. And that's a job loss issue, and of course we need to talk about that. But it's also a huge savings issue. But not only not having drivers, not having parking. Because the only time this thing needs to be mo like, uh, immobile is when it's being fixed or charged, right? Which means suddenly you have a much smaller number of cars serving a much greater number of people, right? Now, some of the people who are really gung-ho are like, this is gonna take 90% of the cars off of the roads of the denser parts of our urban cores. I'm not quite sure that I'm ready to go that far, but I am sure that it's gonna move a whole lot of people from being people who own a car because that once in a while to people who don't own cars. And that itself is a big change. Ignore the picture of the water wheel. Um, <laughs> the, so, it's a big change in part because people don't want cars, right? It's already true of millennials, right? But it's not just true of millennials, it's true globally. I sat in a very uncomfortable meeting with representatives from a car company who were trying to figure out what to do about the fact that Chinese young people don't want cars, right? Driving kind of sucks, and people don't want to do it, especially if they have other things they could be doing, right? And if you're driving in a car, if you're riding in a car where somebody else or something else is doing the driving, or better yet, if you're on transit, you can do other things, right? You know, there's a whole lot of Candy Crush that can get played, for example, <laughs> right? And, you know, what we can automate in our cities is, I think, kind of open for a guess. This, when I, when I was at IDEO, this was a thing that we worked on, which was a, a self-driving delivery vehicle. Um, I suggested that we come up with one of these that was like covered in graffiti and scratched in initials, but, Apparently that concept didn't fly very much. But you, know, you don't actually even need necessarily people at, at the service uh, areas. 
um, because you know you have these situations where uh, you know we have like robot chargers. That fills me with a weird dread that I can't quite <laughs> name. Um, and here's the thing. Some people are like, oh, you're returning people to cars. Like, there's going to be more cars. There's cars. These are cars. But here's the thing. The real, real killer use of a ride, you know, on-demand ride, is getting to transit. And companies like Lyft know it, right? A big part of their whole new push is trying to get transit agencies to cooperate with them, give them privileged access in a way, to like be able to get people to transit stations that maybe they're running late, they don't have time to get there, or maybe that particular transit station's too far to walk easily or too far to bike even. Um, and it, it makes transit easier, not harder. Right? I ride BART way more than a human should, um, which is our regional transit train. Um, and I can tell you, there are plenty of times when the difference between me being able to get to BART and not is being able to call an Uber driver. I don't live that far away, just a mile. Most of the time I can walk it. But there are days where otherwise I would be late. And we're just going to see more and more and more of these kind of possibilities unfolding. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because I'm running a little behind. And we're just going to talk about what transit itself can be because there's no reason why the transit itself can't be automated, too. Um, all of this, though, comes to the big payoff. Remember how we were talking about that 1.8 trillion in asphalt that we're going to need to spread over our nation to get things back up to standards? Well, what if we just didn't? What if cities divested themselves of their roads, not rebuilt them? We could do a lot with that space, right? I, don't, I haven't run the numbers or seen the numbers for Boulder, but in a lot of cities, it's 40, 50, 60, even 70% of the surface area is covered with roads or parking. That's a lot of land. We could do a lot of things on that land. We could build houses on those streets, right? There's a bunch of proposals in London now to take some of the larger uh, uh, roads and actually do road diets, narrow down the amount of road, and build homes in the street, which might feel something much like this. Right? I'm not suggesting that Boulder or any other city immediately go out and start digging foundations in the middle of the road, but the point is, that's a wasted resource that we could make use of. And again, I don't do a lot of predictions, but I think cities, smart cities, should not be building more parking. They should be getting rid of it as fast as they can. Right? I, here's my prediction. In 10 years, any city that requires parking with new development is going to be considered behind the curve. That it's just going to be like, what, you still require parking? It's going to be a sign that you don't get what's going on. Um, I think this is one of the very few things where like, the tipping point is <laughs> imminent, thanks in part to like Shupistas and others like that. Um, and it, great, it gives us some great opportunities, like these students in Atlanta who took this abandoned parking structure and built tiny homes in the middle of it. Yeah, kind of kind of cute. Uh, and here's the thing, a world of much denser, right, of much denser cities built to support car-free living with zero carbon systems, that's a world that has a future. Any world that's not that world, as far as we know, doesn't have much of a future. So we need the YIMBY movement, right, but we need it like supercharged and mutated and gargantuan, right? <laughs> I mean, Yimby's awesome, but what about Yomp? Yes, on my planet. Um, OK, that's dumb. But you get the point, right? We need a movement of people everywhere who are plowing through the barriers, especially the silly ones, to development and starting to think about how do we use this opportunity right, to not only deliver on housing you know, in a way that actually maybe gets us caught up to the demand, but also to use that housing to create dense places that are, where we're able to live without cars, right? Where we're able to live with much lower footprints, where we're able to pioneer the kind of innovations that the other four billion people who are about to be living in cities need, right? To do that, you know, we need a mass movement. And I would put to you that the best thing that the Yimby movement could do is immediately make like a corporation and start acquiring other movements. Um, you know, there's the transportation movement, right? There's the climate movement. There's the social equity movement. All these things relate to what you're doing. 
If you want to be more inclusive, you can be acquired by them. I'm not like, you know, I don't have a horse in the race. But the point is, it's the same fight. And it's not just the same fight in each city, it's the same fight in every city. And you're on the same side as everyone. And there's interest. I go to so many things, so many things. And like everywhere in the world, people are talking about how do we do this better. And the problem is that we can't build what we can't imagine, right? So there's small scale things where people are trying to help people understand what density might be like, what this change might be like, what that change might be like. And often, in my experience, these things are packed. People want to know, right? But there are still, as Martin Luther King Jr. said, all too many people who, in some great period of social change, fail to achieve the mental outlooks that the new situation demands. There is nothing more tragic than to sleep through the revolution. You know, or as the kids say, get woke. And I want to tell you how we do that, in my opinion. And it's the last thing I want to leave you with. So in Norse mythology, there are the three sisters, the Norns, right, who weave the fates of us all. And I read once, and it's way too good a thing to fact check, um, that their names mean that which is, that which is becoming, and that which may yet be. That which is, that which is becoming, and that which may yet be. And I think that's a really fruitful way to look at our situation. And I've been trying to talk with you about what I see that is and what I see that is becoming. But I would invite you to really start to think about that which may yet be. It's what I'm doing with my career. I'm moving to essentially talking only about that which may yet be. I'm working on a project, Heroic Future, which is about imagining what would we be like if we were the people who built a society that tackled the challenges that humanity faces. Who would we be? Who would we be if we were heroes? Um, and I want to invite you all to come on that journey. Because if you're in this room, you're somebody who I want to hear from and who I would love to share my ideas with. So starting next month, we're launching a whole project. And I'd love to bring you in as sort of free, cool members of it. You can email me there if you want to be a part of it, if you want to be, you know, let in on the project, right? Or if you just want to tell me that I'm dumb or, you know, full of it or got a slide wrong. I get a lot of those emails, <laughs> usually from the same guy. So, um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, email me and we'll set it up, right? Because maybe it's not Yomp, but it's something bigger than Yimby. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.